I am Daniel Jurasek. I am preparing my uh, thesis for, for the university and uh, I have a pleasure to talk with uh, Mr. Sam Furstenberg, uh, director of uh, many well-known uh, American action movies of the 80s, for example, American Ninja. Uh, welcome, Mr. Furstenberg. Thank you yeah. for being here. I'm and, happy uh, to be with you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Um, firstly, uh, I would like to ask you uh, to tell me about the start of your uh, career as an action movie director. How did you come to, to the idea uh, to direct action movies? Uh, I, I uh, was going to film school and also I was in my uh, uh, master degree. I went to uh, to master degree in, in uh, film in the university here in Los Angeles. And I, by then, I, I was already five, uh, more than five years assistant director working in the movie business. Mm -hmm. Because earlier I, I did the, the, the first degree, the BA. And while I was doing the master degree, I, while I was going to school two years, just like you mentioned, two years, I managed to, to, to produce, to, to, to write, to direct, and to produce with a friend a, a picture, a movie. But this was a social drama. Uh, in my mind, when I thought about myself as going, uh, becoming a director, I never thought that I will end up in action. But rather, uh, I thought I would do a um, social drama, social relevant drama movies. Uh, when the movie was finished, I uh, worked for many years for two Israelis, Menachem Golan and Yoram Globus. As, as assistant director in their companies. Mm -hmm. And and by then it was uh, 1980 and they purchased the company Canon. Yeah. Canon Film, it was a company in New York that they moved it to Hollywood, to Los Angeles. I just finished this movie that I told you about. The name of the movie is One More Chance. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a story about prisoner coming out of prison, trying to adjust to... Uh, put his life back together in the streets of Los Angeles. And they took this movie for distribution. This company, Canon, oh, yeah. took this movie for distribution. And uh, the movie, we went to some festival. It was not a commercial success. The company was at the beginning, Canon Film. It was the first or the second year of the company. And they produced a movie which is called Enter the Ninja was directed yes. by the head of the company, Menachem Golan, he directed the movie. Yes. And the movie has a, was a moderately success. Success had a moderate success, an independent company. It's not a studio. It's not a big uh, uh, movie from a big studio. But because for such a small company, it was a success, they wanted immediately to make a sequel. Mm -hmm. And they already had a, uh, an idea. The company had an idea uh, to use... Sho Kasugi, the, the, the actor, one of the actors who played in Enter the Ninja, yes. and make with him in another movie which was called Revenge of the Ninja. It's to make a sequel. They, now, uh, the, the same person, Menachem Golan, did, he did not want to, the, to direct this movie. Correct. He was already busy with the company, he didn't want to direct another movie, and I just finished One More Chance. So they mm -hmm. turned to me and they asked me if I will direct, you know, I, here I pro, I, I've proven myself that I can put together a movie. <laughs> so, okay, this guy can put together a movie, he can direct. So they asked me if I will direct uh, this Revenge of the Ninja. Mm -hmm. And they had some hesitation because it had action. It's uh, uh, supposedly, I, I, I demonstrated that I can do drama, but I did not show that I can do uh, action. An action. But, uh, you know, I, I told them, don't worry, I will learn the subject, I will, I will learn how to do action. Uh, so, to make a long story short, we went out and I directed this Revenge of the Ninja movie with Sho Kasugi, and it was a martial art movie, action movie, mm -hmm. full of action. I knew from the beginning it's not, I, 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 I am familiar with action movies, you know, I, we all when we grew up, uh, yes. I grew up in the 50s, 1950s, 1960s, I was a boy. I saw a lot of Westerns, which are mm -hmm. action. I saw James Bond. I saw uh, war, you know, 
American uh, Second World War uh, movies. All of this is action and uh, gangster movies, action. So I, I'm familiar with action. I'm not. I was also. I'm also a big fan of uh, the samurai movies of Akira Kurosawa. Ah, yes. Full of action. Seven Samurai is full of action. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> so I was familiar with the subject, and I told them, okay, and I directed this movie, Revenge of the mm -hmm. Ninja. 45 minutes, it's a 19 minutes movie, but 45 minutes is action. Either yeah, chase great. or action. <laughs> and, uh, and the movie, suddenly, when we finished everything and the company was ready to sell it, the big, the studio MGM, they saw the movie and they liked it. And they took it to distribution from Canon Film. And for mm -hmm. Canon, this was a big success that a, a, a mm -hmm. big company like MGM, major studio Hollywood, took, took the movie. So, so immediately they got me rolling into another movie, Ninja Three: The Domination, and another one, American yeah. Ninja, Reve uh, Avenging Force that you have in the background. So, the, to answer the question, that's how by accident I became an action by director. <laughs> yeah, that's that's great. That's a great story. And and uh, do you remember how it came that it it was uh, exactly ninja? Why why this uh, um, phenomenon ca came to to the uh, American action movies from from the Far East, from Japan? Why why, why ninja? So this was uh, the 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 time was 1980, 1980, yeah. 1981. Prior to this. <clears throat> In Hong Kong, there were Hong Kong was the, the film industry in Hong Kong was making a lot of martial art movies. Uh, yes, we used to call them kung fu movies or karate movies. So this goes all the way back to the fifties, nineteen sixties, nineteen seventies, and uh, big uh, martial arts stars came out of it. Uh, you know, of course, Bruce Lee and uh, etc. and others. Mm -hmm. In America, in the Hollywood industry, film industry, uh, of course, there were a lot of action movies, but he, also in the 70s, there was kind of a beginning of martial art movies, which are American, which was Chuck Norris. Uh, mm -hmm. Bruce Lee came over. Bruce Lee was, uh, was American, actually. So uh, uh, Chuck Norris, Bruce Lee, there are there were a few movies, Octagon, if I remember yeah. one of the names. Yes. But all of this were in the 70s. But uh, all of those movies dealt with regular, so what we called regular martial art, either the art mm -hmm. of karate or judo or jiu-jitsu or any other kind of uh, uh, type of martial art. The ninja type of martial art, which is specifically Japanese, it's yes. not, uh, you know, the other other martial arts are Chinese, Japanese. Mm -hmm. Ninjutsu is only Japanese. And this is part of the Japanese mythology and uh, Japanese uh, history. Uh, during the time of the shoguns, there were samurais, good guys, and there were yeah. ninjas, the bad guys. <laughs> bad guys, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so there were some uh, Japanese movies with ninjas and Japanese television shows with mm -hmm. ninjas. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, even in the Hong Kong movies, in the Chinese movies, in the Hong Kong movies, here and there, uh, a group, the idea of uh, ninja fighters appeared, but never as the main subject. It was not the main subject in the Chinese movies. Yes. So this was up to the 80s. In uh, 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 1980, what happened, 1979, somebody came to Menachem Golan. Uh, his name is Mike Stone. He's a... a famous American martial artist, was champion mm -hmm. of America. And he was, uh, you know, the same friendly with Bruce Lee and uh, Chuck Norris. And he suggested to Kenon, to Menachem Golan, the head of Kenon, let's make a movie to make a movie where the subject is ninja. And the ninjas are the villains and the ninjas are also the heroes, the protagonists, yeah, right. the, the antagonists, everything. So this was the first time that in the Western, as you are asking, in the in the world of the Western cinema, somebody introduced yeah. the idea that the ninja will be the main subject of a martial mm -hmm. art movie, not just sidekicks or side side. Yeah. And that's how they made the movie. The, I was not involved in it in any shape. They already made this movie, Enter the Ninja. Yes. Then it fell into my hand 
in the movie Revenge of the Ninja, and then we made another movie, Ninja 3, The Domination, and it made it, the whole subject, more popular mm -hmm. in the Western, for, for Western uh, 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 movie viewers, and internationally. We, we were talking about Africa, South America, other places in the world, Australia, Europe, and, and, uh, and it came to a peak when we eventually made the movie American Ninja. American yes. Ninja was very popular all over the world, and, and American Ninja abandoned the, the Far East idea altogether. Suddenly it became like Americans in American military base, and the good guys, the bad guys, everybody was Western. And, yeah. and it was, it's a little bit crazy idea, but anyway, it is, and we abandoned. So this made it popular. When we made American Ninja, it was 1985, it made it popular all over the world because it was exotic, something new, mm -hmm. something... Mm -hmm. You know, when I was a uh, boy, 90, in the 50s, 1950s, uh, Tarzan was the ninja. You know, <laughs> this was exotic, yeah. was a different type of hero in the jungles. And, uh, so for me as a kid, this was Tarzan. Uh, in the 80s, it was for the boys, for the... For the Young, young viewers around the world, it was the ninja, an exotic, interesting uh, kind of hero with, mm -hmm. with a new weapon, all kind of uh, exotic and strange and mis and it also full of mystique and mystery. mystery. So mm -hmm. I, I think that's kind of answer your question to the best of my knowledge from a yes, very good. <laughs> from Thank sociology you. point of view. <laughs> yeah, that it's, it's very interesting because I, I, I will tr we'll try to make uh, this background also. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I've, got, I've got a copy of American Ninja here, the Hungarian edition. Oh, uh, interesting. It's, 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 a, it's a twin pack with uh, John Carpenter's Big Trouble in Little China. I don't know why, but <laughs> both Martial great Art, movies. Martial Art, yeah. Martial Art, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, um, and I can say that uh, my brother, I, and my friends, we, we grew up also with, with these movies, uh, ninja movies. Um, I also had the chance to see uh, Enter the Ninja in the Hungarian cinema, um, but uh, it was, I think it was 1987 or so when it came to the movies. American Ninja wasn't in the, in the movie, only on, on video. Um, ex ex uh, imported from Germany, probably in copied uh, tapes and so. <laughs> yeah, and um, speaking of um, of American Ninja, so Joe Armstrong, the the uh, protagonist of of the movie, is um, in my opinion not not a typical um, hero of the 80s. It's not 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 the Rambo style. So it's it's a it's another kind of uh, um, hero. How would you characterize him? So. When we, the idea, a uh, little bit history, the idea of yeah. making an American ninja came from the head of the company, from uh, Menachem Golan. He called me one day and he said, I want to make another ninja movie. They, they, it was very commercial. They sold it. Uh, they, they did good money. They made good money with us. So he told me, but this time he said, I want to make American ninja. Mm -hmm. And this will be the title. So this was the only idea was American Ninja. There was nothing else. They put me together with producers and with a writer. The writer was Paul DeMilke. And because there was no nothing, just, just a name, just a title, we were free to do whatever we wanted. <laughs> so there was the writer, myself, and the producer, and we started to talk, and we started to bounce ideas. And somehow we decided that it will be fitting a ninja ninja character protagonist if he is an anti-hero, mm -hmm. a negative hero, I mean, yeah. whatever it's called, a reluctant hero. In in uh, in the Hollywood jargon in America, we call it reluctant hero. So this is in the mold of uh, let's say James Dean. That, uh, 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 or if you remember the Western movie High Noon, yes. Gary Cooper, he, yes, he yes. doesn't want to fight. He's a he's a reluctant hero. He, his character is a, it's a it's one of those uh, hero character that doesn't want to fight. And so is Yujimbo in the movie uh, in the Akira Kurosawa movie. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, he's a samurai that he doesn't want trouble. He doesn't want to fight. The trouble come to him. So that's what yes. decision we decided to do it. So you're right. It's not the Rambo character who goes out. It's not the, the type of um, uh, the, the typical movies of after Vietnam. After Vietnam, yes. the typical Hollywood movies were that this hero, uh, either it will be Chuck Norris or Sylvester Stallone or Schwarzenegger, they, they know exactly what to do and they go out and they, uh, and they uh, save the, the honors of the Americans who lost the war in Vietnam. Yes, yes. So this was after Vietnam, you know, so this was the atmosphere. For some reason, because we liked it, it's a, just a dramatic choice, we decided to go with the reluctant hero, kind of a James Dean-ish t- character that doesn't want to fight. And that fits the, the character of a ninja movie that needs a lot of mysticism. We, yes. we decided. And, and once we started to write, I didn't write it, the, the writer wrote the script, uh, Paul Demilke, when he started to write it, it developed into this character of a guy who does not want to fight, but if you push him enough, he will come out with all his force. And mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and at this moment, halfway through the movie or 60% in, into the movie, he becomes a Sylvester Stallone. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, a, it's a very good, yeah. It's a very good concept, I think, because there is a lot of mystery uh, around his, uh, his his character as well. Yeah. His background, his childhood, how he was raised by, by a, a ninja master. Uh, who is now a gardener of the uh, <laughs> of the uh, um, antagonist there in in um, hiding there, yeah. And um, but in and, hi- and, uh, Daniel, in hindsight, many people who who uh, uh, who look at the movie and uh, think about it and digest it, they feel that it's the same. It it also fit into this genre of movies that after Vietnam, that the hero. Mm-hmm. The American hero can do anything if you give him the right, you know, in the right. Mm-hmm. If you don't stop him, uh, because the 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 feeling was that the soldiers in Vietnam, the military in Vietnam, was not successful because the politicians stopped them. Yes, this was the feeling. Yes. So, uh, and all those uh, after Vietnam movies are telling you if you don't stop the hero, don't hold him, or if he rebel against the authorities, he will go in and he will do his job. He will so make many it right. people uh, who analyze this uh, American Ninja, they say it's also part of this group of movies. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, yes. Even the fact that it starts in the other, the second half of the movie, but it has the same feeling. Of if you don't stop the hero, if he knows what he's doing, let him go, he will do the job. <laughs> yes, and, and, and um, um, speaking about politics, so there is um, a little bit of political background of this movie as well, but... Um, can you can you probably tell me about uh, or or name some some uh, movies from the 80s probably also yours but but other action movies which which are typical very tight with political background probably uh, uh, vietnam movies uh, as well after vietnam right number one in canon they made a, a series of movies with chuck norris mm-hmm. uh, uh, what was it called uh, not behind enemy line uh, missing in action and- no you yeah. mean missing in action? Missing in action. Three movies yeah. missing in action. Yeah, yeah. They're all the same. So uh, Chuck Norris in canon, missing in action. They're all they deal with the subject directly, and it has mm-hmm. the same feeling. If, if Chuck mm-hmm. Norris, if you don't stop him, he will go and save the the situation. Of course, the the three Rambo movies with yeah. uh, Sylvester Stallone, no question about it. And and uh, in canon, they also had another movie with David Carradine behind the enemy line. Mm-hmm. Also in the same uh, the same subject, so the the atmosphere was saturated. I will tell you, not long ago, uh, at some time ago, I saw a movie, uh, a, a documentary movie about this subject, mm-hmm. which was yeah. done actually in England. Uh, the documentary, uh, and it, and uh, the, I think the name of the movie is Rambo Reagan and uh, and uh, <laughs> another word, but it deals with the Reagan era. And the, uh, you know the, uh, the Reagan era in the American politics, yeah, and how it uh, at the same time uh, equate with the action heroes who were created in Hollywood. You know, mm-hmm. they say Rambo, but they mean all the other. Yeah, action I need to heroes. find this somewhere on the internet. Yeah. Or it's, it's uh, I'll tell you in in 
Uh, now I remember, in England came a cassette of Remo Williams, which was also part of this. Uh, yes, I saw that. Remo Williams. Movie as well. And this is uh, it, uh, the Blu-ray cassette of Remo Williams. The documentary is on the same disc. Wow, yes. Yeah, yeah. And it's good. Uh, I, I, they also interviewed me. But <laughs> that's not the reason it's good. They interviewed me also. But there are also psychologists and sociology people and historians. Very, very, very interesting. Rambo, it's called Reagan, Rambo, and uh, Remo. And Remo Wow. Williams. That's well, the name. I will, I will remember that and, and look for this because it's, it's, it's on the cassette. It's, it came out in Britain. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, another question about the background of these movies. Uh, we spoke about politics and can, uh, uh, in your opinion, is there also uh, um, a social background? So can can those movies? Uh, show a viewer the, the, the social the, uh, background, the, so the society of America in the 80s some, somehow. Yeah. I, I <clears throat> Sorry, I guess it, no it, it's not my expertise, of course, I'm in the movie, I'm telling stories, I'm, I'm one mm -hmm. of the people who tell stories, and, and I, at least in my case, I cannot say about uh, everybody else, uh, but the, the, the 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 force that is moving me is telling stories. I don't analyze. Yeah. I don't write political. I don't particularly make movies because of a po political reason. Just it's a good story. I feel that this is a good story. Okay, but in general, at the area at the time, uh, this, this was the mood. Uh, when I arrived in America, it was the seventies, and it, the the war was still going in Vietnam. But uh, uh, 73, 74, the, the war ended with a big disappointment. And there were two major forces in the American society among young people. Of course, there were the, the traditional, the people who believed in the military and believed in the, in the rightness of uh, America to be involved in Vietnam. And on the other hand, you had the hippies and the people who were fighting and demonstrating against the war in Vietnam and all peace and happiness and flowers. And uh, uh, so this was, the, this was the, the, the forces in the 70s. By the time we arrived to the type of movies that we are talking about, 79, 78, 79, 80, 81, the hippie movement was over, more or less. And all this, anyway, the war was over in Vietnam already, six, seven years, eight years. And, uh, but, but the feeling, the general feeling was of a, a disappointment that uh, America spent so many years in Vietnam, so many soldiers died, young people died in Vietnam. And for what reason? There was no reason. Uh, and, uh, so there was a failure. The, the feeling was that there was a failure in the, on the uh, uh, political uh, echelon, in the political part yes. of the... Uh, so maybe the White House, the Pentagon, they failed. They didn't do, uh, they, they failed the public. And, and, uh, and kind of that's, I think that all of this together brought about for this kind of movies to come out and mm -hmm. uh, to play out. Not all, not all of them uh, action, even if you look at the movie Rocky, which is not action, which is mm -hmm. boxing, that's the same feeling. The, the one man, the lonely man who can stand against everything and prevail. So this was, I believe that this was the feeling. Again, it's, this is not, uh, I'm not a sociologist. That's, <laughs> yeah, but that's great. That's great. Uh, but but that is kind of what was the feeling. But uh, of course, there are many, many uh, uh, work and books about the time, the 80s and the, the, the general feeling in the in the American, and then came a, a, a and then came a, a time of optimism, of hope. Uh, yes. Second part of the eighties, the nineties was a lot of uh, hope. The, the it was the, the end of the uh, the Cold War, Cold War yeah. and the collapse of the Soviet Union, and mm -hmm. of course. Yes. Yes. Um, um, uh, I got, got another pe question about. Uh, violence portrayed in in the in the movies so in action movies uh, there is always they're, they're always violent 
uh, what do you think? Is is it uh, the main part of those movies, or is is there any action movie without violence? Can it be? <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> uh, 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 my feeling. Again, I'm not a, I'm not a psychologist, but my feeling is that uh, telling stories with violence, first of all, is very very old in the human species. Yeah, I believe that even when when men they were sitting in the cave around the the, the the fire and one man was telling stories, they told story of vi with violence with animals yeah. eating people. I I, I imagine, yeah. but but it, it has a purpose in drama. The reason we have drama, the reason we have stories, plays, uh, opera, whatever you want, is to release some kind of. Uh, uh, psychological uh, pressure that we have that we cannot we cannot do mm -hmm. and uh, we cannot m most of us <laughs> don't go out in the street and or in the field and kill lions and kill elephants and we don't but in our image in, but we need it to survive yeah but we don't do it so in order to release this conflict inside there are there is drama there are stories we tell stories about heroes not most of us are not hero and brave. Most of us yeah. are not James Bond, but we would like to be. We have this urge inside. Then that's why we have a story and we release this uh, pressure inside. Mm -hmm. So violence is part of it. It's not for everybody in the world, but th uh, there is a big part of people in the world that are what they are watching boxing matches. You know, in right. sport, this is a violent right. sport. Two people are hitting each other, and they don't run beautifully for time. They just hit each other until one of them falls down to the ground. Yeah. But they don't do it. They sit back in the theater, and two boxers are boxing. The same thing for violence. Now, in movies, the most the, the, there was always violence on the stage. Even in a Shakespearean play, there was violence. You know, people are dying, swords, uh, whatever. And... Uh, so this goes back to Shakespearean time and to the Greek theater way back to the yeah. to beginning of theater. And, but in the movies, which are much more graphic and much more visual, uh, the movie took the violence to a level that we didn't, as a, a human race, we never saw before on, on a screen. screen. If you didn't go to war, most of us did not participate in war. We did not see people being killed. But in the movies, suddenly the movie, because it's graphic, because it's big on a big screen, violence came up to a level that was not known before. Now, saying this, I would like to say that there is a different type, different level of violence in movies in the way it's portrayed, in how, re how real it is. You see some, you see some, let's say, war movies, which the violence is so graphic, you know, I see sometimes war movies that I'm, what did I see lately? Jagged Edge. The, vi the violence was so strong that it was like shock, you know, like, like I was inside. But in the other hand, you have violence, which is not, you take it kind of theatrical, James Bond. Yes. Let's say James Bond is not real. He's smiling, you know, violence in a way of, you as an audience, you have this feeling that this violence is, they're not trying to portray violence in real, in real way, but in an entertaining way, if you can say so, I know, <laughs> violence entertaining. So the same was in the ninja movies. The yes. ninja movies had this, this kind of, uh, the, the ones that I directed, I don't know about other movies, had this feeling of little bit that, Theatrical, that okay, you can, you see violence, you see blood, you see people getting hurt, they fall down to the ground, they die, all kind of ninjas falling with shuriken in the head. But there is a feeling in the movie that it's okay, it's only a play. When yes. the camera stops, everybody stands up. So it was, it's not vicious and realistic. And uh, so there is a different way to portray violence, but I think it's a basic human need to see violence in drama. Mm -hmm. I know, again, it's not for everybody. Uh, usually, it, th those kind of movies are not popular with women, usually. But they are popular with young men, you know, from seven Mostly. years old to, <laughs> to 57. I don't know. Yeah. This yeah, is and, kind and of the range of those movies. 
Yes. Met people and they come and they release pressure. You you see violence and you that's release pressure because there's something that you are not going to do, but it's part of our uh, existence, part of our yes. And it, and it is also um, speaking about violence when when in the action movies um, uh, innocent people die. Somehow we as viewers, we as audience. Uh, step more easily over the, those scenes as in a as in a drama because um, we know that uh, there will be there will be a revenge there will be uh, the, will we put it put it right and so, somehow yeah when uh, villains die yeah you're right when villains die in a drama you know that there is a just cause the heroes the the protagonists the good guys are doing it for a good reason now yeah. of course uh, uh, you know that's not always correct. There were uh, old Western movies where the cowboys used to to kill hundreds of Indians, and today we look at those movies like, whoa, oh, no, no, that's not good. <laughs> that's t totally not not right. But at the time, they looked at it in a different way, and uh, of course, yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. Um, and also, I, I've got also this uh, this idea that uh, the protagonist of of the eighties action movie um, is also. Is also killing people, but it's somehow a, a justification um, because um, he, he he needs to do that for for uh, getting things right and and uh, make the good side win or so. Yeah, and, and in in the Hollywood industry in general, uh, unless you are talking about the very sophisticated movies, uh, yeah. there are stereotypes. So you know, yeah. okay, we go in uh, after the war in the. 50s, 60s, 70s, it was always killing Nazis, killing Germans. So it was okay, you can kill you can kill Nazis, that's fine. Then it became killing Russians, you know, Russians were the, the, the villains. Yeah. Because they are um, the Russians on the other side of the curtain, Iron Curtain. So yeah. North Korean always. Then there was a, a time that the uh, uh, Muslim terrorists, Arab terrorists mm -hmm. became the stereotype of the people that they... But uh, that, of course, depends on the point of view and what, what do you uh, uh, portray as a stereotype. But in general, the drama is built in a way that you, let's say you take a gangster movie, a regular American gangster movie, The Godfather, uh, let's yes. say, or whatever. So, yeah, there are, in the street, there are bad people. They do bad, bad thing. This is within the drama. And we all know we suffer as a citizens. And then comes uh, the good guys, uh, either Spider-Man or the FBI or <laughs> Superman, and they clean the street and they kill everybody who is the bad and uh, villain. And, and that's the nature of drama. That's uh, Again, I mean, it goes all the way back to Shakespeare and it mm -hmm. goes all the way back to uh, Greek theater. Yeah. That, uh, the, that's why we said there are protagonists, antagonists. Those are the bad guys, those are the good guys. And the good guy, we as an audience, we sit in the theater, we sit in the movie theater or in the opera, doesn't matter, and we identify with the good guys. We always want to be in the good side, in the side of the good people. And at the of end, course. if everything is correct, there is a catharsis at the end of the play and the good guy wins and the bad guys get punished. And that's how we like to see the world in this kind of order. That, that's, and that's, that's why true. drama exists. Yeah, it it everything everything uh, comes from the from the ancient Greek theater, as you as you mentioned, and I I also think it's it's right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and in in your movies, um, there you, you mentioned before uh, Ninja Three: The Domination. It was a, a kind of uh, for me. It was a kind of mixture of styles because there was a little bit of. Uh, uh, of course, a, a lot of action, then uh, a little bit of horror, then uh, some something with dancing, also like flash dance movie or like this. Uh, it was very interesting. Uh, how how this how did this idea came to you or to the producers? How uh, this mixture to do? After we finished the movie Revenge of the Ninja, which was the mm -hmm. first movie action movie I, I did, the company the, it was I told you it was kind of a success. MGM took it for distribution. It was distributed uh, all over America, all over the world. So among action crowd, it was a success. 
And uh, the company Canon Film, they wanted to make a, a sequel immediately, Ninja mm -hmm. Number Three. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, uh, the same uh, uh, head of the company, Menachem Golan, told me he wants a movie with a with a woman this time. Oh, it was right. after Alien, Sigonia Weaver, you know, mm -hmm. and th this was the feeling. So I said, okay, that's a good good opportunity, and uh, uh, the the hero the Protagonist is going to be a woman ninja. Sho Kasugi, this was the hero of the movie uh, Revenge of the Ninja, the actor, he did not agree with this idea. Mm -hmm. uh, in his opinion, uh, uh, ninja woman doesn't have enough power and uh, traditionally it doesn't, doesn't work. I think he was right eventually, <laughs> but <laughs> at the time, and, and he wanted to change the script. He was also, he's, he's in the script also. He wanted to change the script and he was really against it. We, uh, I was working with the writer, uh, 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 the same writer who wrote the movie uh, Revenge of the Ninja. Uh, Jim, uh, I don't remember his name. Uh, uh, same writer and we couldn't, we couldn't figure out the idea. At the same time, uh, first of all, for me, as a director to experiment in different genres of movies is a, is a pleasure. Why not? You know, I, yes, yes. <laughs> if there is a chance, I, I like, I, I'm not a martial artist. I don't come from martial art. And, mm -hmm. I, and for me, even in the first movie that I made, Revenge of the Ninja, it was important not to make the movie only martial art. So mm -hmm. we mixed it with different type of uh, action, so-called regular, I called regular Hollywood action. Mm -hmm. And uh, so here, I, I just saw the movie Poltergeist, Toby Hooper directed, I really liked it, I was interested. Yeah. Uh, not a few years earlier, I saw The Exorcist, <laughs> it was the, the first horror movie I ever saw in my life. It was frightening, Exorcist. frightening, <laughs> even today. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, as you mentioned, Fleshdance was, uh, was very popular at the time, Aliens with Sigonia Weaver, Fleshdance. So our solution to, to, to resolve the dilemma that we have was that the woman, the lead woman, will be possessed by a spirit of a ninja. This was the idea. Now, it fits because the ninja is a lot of mysticism and a lot of uh, mystical ideas in the ninja anywhere. Anyway, in the mythology, the mythology of the ninja includes a lot of mystical and mysticism. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so, so that, that makes sense from a cinema point of view <laughs> that the spirit of a dead ninja goes into the body of the woman, just like in The Exorcist. <laughs> Billy Friedkin directed The Exorcist. Yeah. And uh, that's how it came about. A lot of uh, influence from the movie The Poltergeist that mm -hmm. uh, Toby Hooper directed. And uh, because we needed her to be physical, uh, the idea that uh, uh, the spirit of a dead ninja will choose a woman that has a physical ability, so we made her a dancer, that uh, aerobic dancer, so suddenly it collided with flesh dance. <laughs> I think it's, was, it's uh, just great, it's awesome. <laughs> masculine awesome. job, climbing telephone poles. Mm -hmm. So that's how, and, and once we started to work on the script, more and more ideas came about. Mm -hmm. There's a scene with the exorcist, and, and uh, etc. So that's how it developed and became what it is. Uh, incidentally, the movie when it came out was not as successful as Revenge of the Ninja. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's why I say Shokasugi was right. <laughs> yeah. In hindsight, he was right. Pe uh, people did not accept it so well, the idea that a woman is a ninja. And uh, especially at the time was not, uh, there was, uh, there was uh, Cynthia Rothrock was uh, mm -hmm. a martial artist that making, she was making movies, there was Sigonia Weaver, but not, not, was not accepted, was not successful. But strangely enough, in the last few years, in the last 10 years, it became a cult movie. Yeah. It, this movie, Ninja 3 The Domination, has a resurrection. It came up again as a cult movie, and it's now being uh, screened in festivals, special screening, really? film clubs. Yeah, I, I'm invited. Sometimes I'm invited, sometimes they're asking me to send a, a video uh, introduction in film festival all over the world. Sometimes a conference or film clubs of uh, people who like cult movies. And mm -hmm. just before the pandemic, two years ago, exactly, now we are yet January <laughs> 2022, it was January 2020, uh, 20, 
I was invited to a screening in Los Angeles in a small club, mm-hmm. film club, and they screen uh, uh, movies with a print, not from a video. That's part of the club. They they screen. They have a screening machine, they, and they find the uh, uh, prints. And they found the print of Ninja 3, The Domination. I was invited to introduction, to do the introduction, and then uh, question, Q&A, question and answers. And the theater was full of people. And people wow. came dressed. They come with costumes of Ninja. They come <laughs> to the screening, <laughs> you know, cult movie. And when they see them, they see the movie, they know the lines. So, you know, they, they talk with the screen because they yeah, know the yeah. lines which are coming, like the movie they're like the movie so many room. times they saw it so many times <laughs> they yeah. saw it so many great and it was a fantastic screening people asked for my autograph I answered wow. questions but I did not believe the enthusiasm of the people who came to see <laughs> and uh, there are special websites uh, you know uh, fans of Ninja 3 The Domination Facebook wow. pages there is so much activity and, and, and posters and memorabilia changing hands and mm-hmm. So much activity around this movie that I am, I'm totally surprised, totally surprised. But that happened only in the last, the last 10 years. Last 10 years. It, it's uh, also great memories for me because uh, uh, it was uh, one of the first action movies we saw as kids. Uh, I think it was in 88, probably. Yeah, probably. And it was a, yeah, it, uh, the, the film is from 84, I think. Okay, made in eighty four, right. and uh, we saw it so four four years later on a on a German dubbed copy, yeah. and in Hungary there was um, in the VHS uh, period so that uh, we received from abroad the cassettes somehow uh, on German or or, or uh, English, and there was a, a narration on this uh, one one person spoke right. in a monotone way and, <laughs> and the there, same thing. Yeah, <laughs> Same thing in Poland when I was yeah. I was in a also film film festival in Gdansk. I was invited mm-hmm. in Gdansk to in Poland film festival. So they told me the same story and they showed yeah. me the bootleg cassette the, mm-hmm. because it was during the communist time and they, they were not allowed to, to have uh, Amer- especially American Ninja. Yes, so, yes, yes. But they have well, one 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 voice. Yeah, narrating yeah. all the all the different. Sometimes. Parts. Sometimes it was it was uh, quite good because uh, some some uh, guys made uh, a, a great effort to to translate, but mm-hmm. others uh, uh, also on that on the copy of uh, Ninja Three: The Domination, what I saw or, the, or what we saw, it was a guy who mm, barely know the story and <laughs> said some things. Uh, there was there was there was a scene I remember when when uh, it was like. Um, it was like some, a guy was killed by the ninja, and uh, the 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 policeman uh, said that um, uh, it looks like he was killed by the professional Japanese uh, killer. And the the guy said in Hungarian, "Do you know where to find a killer, a Japanese professor?" <laughs> Professional Some, professor. Pro, pro, professor, yeah, <laughs> as like a, a doctor or so. <laughs> and we just sat there and, and what? What is that? <laughs> and it was really good. And um, yeah, but but um, um, sometimes it was it was not so not so bad with the translation. It, it was acceptable. Depends and, and who, who made it. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It, it's very good. Uh, Sam, could could you tell me um, probably if it's a good question? Um, which movie are you the most proud of? Uh, uh, of you know, yours. the poster that you have behind you, Avenging Force, mm? is an action movie. It's not a martial art movie. It's action movie. The story is a good, solid story. I really right. like this movie when it comes to action. It was written by uh, James Booth, the mm-hmm. English uh, uh, writer, actor, James Booth. Mm-hmm. So when I read the script, it was solid, good script. Mm-hmm. I, I, I had good budget to do it in New Orleans. It's spectacular. It has right. big, uh, uh, big scenes uh, in New Orleans, in the street, the, the carnival, the Mardi Gras. Mm-hmm. Oh, other yeah. big and, and, and the action itself is good, but also it's, it, it, it has a social message, political message, social message, not only being action, uh, mm-hmm. just action, action, action which the ninja movies are tend to, to be mainly action. Yes. So uh, in Avenging Force, I feel that from a, from a 
from an action movie's point of view, it's the most the movie that I'm the most proud of. It's solid. It's good. It's a good story, and the action is really wonderful, spectacular. Uh, but you know, I made also a musical. I directed a musical, <laughs> Breaking Two Electric Boogaloo. I saw that in the in, the, in uh, here in Hungary in the movies. It uh, yeah. it was shown. Optimistic, yeah. uh, very optimistic, youthful movie. No yeah. violence, only <laughs> dancing, only music, which I like it a lot. And yeah. uh, I also made, I also directed one movie which is called Riverbend. It was not, a, it's not a popular movie. Did not play uh, well around the world for many, many, many reasons. But this is a really social uh, uh, dilemma mm -hmm. of. Uh, uh, Racial injustice in the south of uh, the USA in yeah. in uh, Mississippi in the Mississippi in the sixties, and and uh, it's a fantasy movie about the relationship between black population, white population, mm -hmm. and I, I I I I'm proud of this movie. It's interesting and it's a it's a social subject, a serious social subject. I just so, found it recently on YouTube yeah, again because but, I, uh, I remember that. But you know, uh, Daniel, I cannot deny from all of this, the movie American Ninja is the most popular yeah. movie I directed. <laughs> it's all over the world. And most of the people who approach me and read and send me letters and emails, and that, it's because of the movie American Ninja, not because mm -hmm. of anything else. <laughs> do, you, do you receive a lot, a lot of rec requests from ar around the world? So for don't interviews stop. or... You know, there are so don't many stop. websites. The, the American <laughs> Ninja is this, is, it's like, it's like um, it's like the, our story about Ninja Three: The Domination, but it never died. There was always viewership. There were always fans and viewers of the movie American Ninja all over the world. But in the last few years, it's going crazy because people who are forties, fifties, like you, they remember when they saw American Ninja when they were little boys, and now they see it with the second generation. And there are a lot of young people who are discovering the movie. And for many reasons, because of the nature of action movies, uh, that uh, nowadays everything is superhero, Superman, uh, yeah. Avengers, whatever, huge, huge, big budget. Uh, when people see American Ninja, they identify and they have this feeling of uh, small, low budget, real action movie because mm -hmm. everything we did, we did for real. No, we didn't have special effects. We didn't have any optical no effects. Effect. Yeah. So the action is really. And I think even the young audience, fans of action, they had, they feel it. When they see the movie, they feel it. And there is a wonderful chemistry between Michael Dudikoff, Steve James, and Judy Aronson. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Very innocent love story, good bonding friend, two friends story. Now, there are many things, many things magical in this movie that, yeah. that caused it that for, it's now 37 years. It was 1985, and the movie is still yes. playing and playing in the late night and the streaming all of in all the streaming services came out on many versions of DVD and and now it's in Blu-ray uh, high definition. It doesn't die. It it, it has so much activity, uh, and I'm I'm there are so many posting. There are websites just for American Ninja mm -hmm. for Michael Dudikoff. Wow. There are Facebook groups. Uh, which are very active, just dealing with this uh, American Ninja. So yes, uh, so <laughs> I cannot, uh, I cannot avoid it that I'm the, I'm the director. So, I mean, yeah, my title you are is the director of American Ninja, not the director <laughs> of Avenging Fox. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I just I just rewatched uh, recently uh, Avenging Force as well and and Riverbend as well and, and it was both of them were great American Ninja I, I had it in mind always so I, I saw it a lot of times um, and I just read it somehow somewhere uh, probably on on your website I don't know anymore but uh, is, was it the, so that uh, American Ninja Avenging Force and uh, American Ninja Two were filmed in a row so non-stop could it be it was yeah. so what happened. I'll tell you, Daniel, what happened. We, uh, I directed the, uh, uh, you know, the, the company made the breakdance movie. First Breaking, and then Breaking Two Electric Boogaloo that I directed. Th these two movies made a lot of money for the company. Mm -hmm. they, they were very, very popular, tremendously popular. But the interest in them died immediately. It was one year, two years, boom, nobody was interested. 
uh, the buyers, I, I guess, the distributors around the world wanted more ninja movies. <laughs> they didn't want more breaking <laughs> movies, breakdance movies. They wanted more ninja movies. So the company decided to do American Ninja. And, and uh, they, they decided for some financial reason that we have to do it in the Philippines, to, to film it in the Philippines. So we went to the Phil Philippines and we, we filmed. We found uh, Michael Dudikoff, we found Steam Jet. When we started to filming and we started to see the material, we, we, there was a feeling that it's going good, that something special is happening here. And uh, we finished the filming, we came with all the material back to Los Angeles to, for the editing. The editing uh, facility was in the building of the office, Canon Film. Mm -hmm. And we editing, we're editing the movie, and there is a feeling that this is a good movie. But of course, we don't know what will happen. Nobody ever knows what will happen with movie until it really goes out to the crowd, to the audience. So we finished this movie, and I didn't know there was a script around Avenging Force, which was called Night Hunter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This was actually a script for for Chuck Norris, not for us. It was mm -hmm. a sequel to Invasion USA. Invasion Matt USA. Hunter is the character of you. I didn't know at the time, right. I didn't know. Mm -hmm. Matt Hunter is the character from Invasion USA that or, they already made the movie. Yeah. But Chuck Norris didn't like the script. I I didn't know at the time. So we, just, we are still at the finishing stages of editing American Ninja and the company were very impressed with Michael Dudikoff on the screen, his charisma and Steve mm -hmm. Jett. And they gave me the script and they said, read the script and see if it's good for, but by then it was already rejected by Chuck Norris. So I read the script and I said, yeah, fantastic. I really like the script. So the, the company said, okay, let's go and make it because they, they believed in Dudikov before, even before the movie came out, they already had this feeling that it's good, that he's, mm -hmm. he's going to be good. So the day I finished the editing, we finished the editing, we put the music and we went to New Orleans to, sh to film Avenging Force. And the American Ninja was still, was not distributed in the theater yet, not with VHS, nothing. Okay. When we were in New, in, uh, in so now we have one movie after the other together. When we are in New Orleans, the movie American Ninja opened in America and all over the world, uh, cassette, video, theater, and it's explosion. We, and now we, we, we start to hear that the movie is explosion all over the world, it's successful, <laughs> it's a, and, and we are busy filming another movie, Avenging Force. Okay, we came, the same thing, we took the material, we came back to Los Angeles, we started to edit the movie, or editing the movie. While I'm, we are editing the movie, the company approached me, the heads of the company said, we must make American Ninja number two, because it's so <laughs> successful. The, you know, but by then we knew already that this was a phenomenon. This was unbelievable what happened. So we started to, while I was editing, working in the editing of Avenging Force, at the same time I was working with the writer, Gary Conway, writing American Ninja Number 2. Mm -hmm. The day we finished the editing and we put the music to Avenging Force, next day I was in the airplane on my way to South Africa because they wanted to make it in South Africa mm -hmm. to start preparation of Avenging of American Ninja number two. So this wow. is the reason that one came after the other. It was packed because they wanted it immediately. Now immediately. They, they really yeah, want, yeah. the company wanted it. And yeah. You are correct. And you feel you filmed always on uh, these three movies as, um, and uh, uh, also other ones on on um, exotic locations. Yeah, um, so, sometimes the reason is financial. It's not because of me. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the company has they have money somewhere or they have a better better financial uh, situation and they send the, the 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 crew. They send the movie going in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. and for me, it's beautiful. I traveled all over the world and I saw interesting exotic places: Indonesia, South Africa. I was in South Africa four times. The one time in the Philippines, in New Orleans. The, wonderful uh, Louisiana, interesting mm -hmm. place to, to film movies. Uh, I was in Texas, Riverbend was done in Texas. Texas. In, uh, mm -hmm. So yes, I'm lucky. I, I was lucky to, to travel to exotic, interesting places all over the world uh, to film. Yeah. yeah, speaking about Louisiana, it comes, uh, another movie comes to my mind uh, called Southern Comfort. I think it's from uh, Walter Hill, I guess. 1981. It's also also in the swamps, uh, Louisiana, just like Avenging Force. Right, right, and, it, and uh, similar. 
And uh, yeah. th there was another movie with Gene Hackman, uh, Mississippi Burning. Yeah, yeah, Mississippi also Burning. Also the same, same genre. Yeah, yeah, yeah right, right. Mm. Um, a question about, you mentioned before um, Hong Kong. Uh, if you were asked back then to direct a movie in Hong Kong, so an Asian action movie, what, what uh, could have been your answer? <laughs> in Hong Kong, probably. <laughs> Probably yes. Uh, I I I was a I my career in Hollywood. I did not reject project. All the movie that I directed, except the first one we, we spoke about in the beginning, one more chance. I was not the initiator. I did not write the script. Was not my idea. In all the twenty four twenty five movies I directed, I was hired. Companies mm -hmm. came to me, gave me a script, an idea. Oh, or idea I developed with the writer. But was not my idea. Was not my what I wanted to do. Was not my dream project. So I, I in the I was in the tradition of of the Hollywood, the, the golden time, the golden era of Hollywood, where directors were only directing. You know, in many of the the movies, some director was so busy. John Ford was so busy. He didn't even participate in editing. He finished the movie. Goodbye. He was in the next movie. He was well, not part yes, of the sure. editing. So this is traditionally uh, Hollywood. The directors got the job. So this, so was I. I always got a job. So if I would have been <laughs> approached by a Hong Kong movie, read the script, I'll tell you one script that I rejected because one. I was not crazy about the script, maybe, or, or so I was busy, but I rejected was Bloodsport with Van Damme. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I was given the script and I read the script. Uh, Sheldon Ledditch read this, uh, wrote the mm -hmm. script. He, so you later, don't, you, he directed a few movies. You, you didn't like it, it very much. And, this, and uh, I read the script and said, one location, a script in one location. It's not interesting. <laughs> <laughs> this was my You're right. <laughs> I, I don't think not your style. people will like uh, what movie, the whole movie in one location, one place. I don't think mm -hmm. it will work. So I rejected it and I... <laughs> And then I went to do other movies, Avengers, other movies. etc. But uh, whoa, what, what a mistake! It, later on, it was such a big success. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, when I was uh, approached, Van Damme was not uh, part of the deal. You know, it uh, was only a he, script. He, when I was he given came the script. afterwards. <laughs> so uh, other so I don't know. Maybe I would. But <laughs> if I would have been free and approached well. by a Hong Kong company and have a chance to work in. Uh, and uh, in China, maybe with Jackie Chan, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> and it could be, it, it, it it's be a great, great idea. Yeah. And um, what, what is what is the main difference between, uh, in your opinion, between uh, American and, and Hong Kong action movies of the 80s? In the Hong, the main thing, the main thing is the Hong Kong uh, martial art movie are really concentrated in martial art. Mm -hmm. At least in the beginning. Later, after American Ninja, they changed a little bit. So there was no. Uh, usually, there were the, most of the action was hand-to-hand -hand fighting. Mm -hmm. No chases, no car, no explosion. So much. I, I don't say it, it doesn't exist. It exists, but the main concentration was hand-to-hand -hand fighting to demonstrate abilities in martial art. In one hand, in the other yes. hand, what they did was spectacular. Some of those Chinese movies, Hong Kong movies, reach level of the action is so beautiful. The the hand to hand, the combat, the martial art combat are so sophisticated and beautiful that you sit there and you 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 don't believe. Then came uh, you know James Wu with the guns. L later in the you know nineties, I think came, start they started Chinese movies started with the more of uh, detectives and guns and yes yes martial art. But uh, back then in the 80s, it was all about martial mm -hmm. art and to show the ability of the actors, of the stunt people, how beautifully they can execute this, those. And mm -hmm. some of those movies, some of those combat are fantastic, fantastic. Yes. And again, they did not have blue screen. They didn't have any optical, uh, uh, graphic optical effect, nothing. They had to really do it physically. They did yes. everything physically. Do you, so, do you have... Yep, uh, but uh, but yep. the, the, the storytelling is different. Those are long yeah. movies. Uh, the story is in, in a, the, the drama line. The, the plot is different from American Western. You know, it's a very simple, usually conflict, families, a uh, good uh, rich guy, poor poor girl, they fall in love. <laughs> there is the, the 
the clown of the village, and uh, it, it's uh, similar. It's almost uh, formula stories. Yes. Uh, Then do you do you and, have a favorite the story Hong Kong movie? In those movies, they're more mm -hmm. important to demonstrate this magnificent. Mag yeah, some of them with sword and with hand to hand. Mm -hmm. and some yes. of them. Uh, people can see in the internet, uh, sometimes the, people put on the internet the fight only. The, mm -hmm. those, some of those parts. Magnificent. Mm -hmm. Really beautiful. And do, do you have some uh, uh, a favorite from, from those era, from a, no, a Hong Kong I, movie? Uh, uh, no, not at all. As I told you, when I was approached with America, with the Revenge of the Ninja, I never seen, I never, never seen before. any Hong huh? Kong movie before. <laughs> Later. You know, John Wu and I later, mm -hmm, I, saw. Mm -hmm. I never saw. Sho Kasugi was the one who introduced me to this type of cinema. Mm -hmm. And he showed it to me in Chinese with no subtitle. You know, there are, <laughs> there are some theaters here in Los Angeles mm -hmm. for Chinese audience. They show those movies with no, no subtitle, nothing. Wow. No and you nothing. focused on the action. So, uh, so Sho Kasugi <laughs> took me and showed me those movies in Chinese. It was okay because all I needed to see is the action. <laughs> But this was the first time in my life that I saw, when I met Sho Kasugi, was the first time in my life that I saw Hong Kong a karate movie, a kung fu movies. First time in my life. Is he still making movies today, Sho Kasugi, or is he ret uh, completely retired? Yeah, I don't he's know. in Japan. Uh, yeah. From what I see in the internet, he's in Japan. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, His son, Ken Kasugi, became also a martial arts star yeah. in uh, Japan. Uh, Kane, he was uh, the little boy in the movie Revenge of the Ninja. Yeah, yes. And uh, Sho is, uh, is teaching, from what I understand, from what I see in the internet. But he's back in Japan. So he's teaching. Mm -hmm. Sometimes he's here in Los Angeles. So he's teaching. He's, uh, he was always involved in selling merchandise, uh, ninja merchandise, uh, uniform. Mm -hmm. He has few companies that he's dealing with. Um, He's demonstrating, teaching, but I don't think movies anymore. I don't think no, so. No, no more movies. I don't think so. Mm -hmm. And do you do you have uh, still still contact to your colleagues, to your actors before? So to Michael Dudikoff probably, or do you keep contacts or do yeah, they keep contact to you? Michael Michael Dudikoff lives not far from me, so wow. we're contact. Uh, Judy Aronson, I'm contact. She's I was good friend with, with Steve James, but he he died. He passed yeah. away. And uh, eh, that's uh, basically it. it's 35 years, you know. <laughs> 35 years passing uh, from the time. Um, yes. Yeah, and th those those were the, the the big names that I worked with mm -hmm. uh, were Michael Dudikoff, Tim James, and uh, you know I worked with some uh, name actors. I worked with Eric Roberts. I directed yes. uh, Sean Young, but um, I don't have any contact with them. They, they They mm -hmm. do what they do, and I'm not in this uh, business anymore. <laughs> I'm not in making movie business anymore. I'm in the yes. preserving the legacy, in the yeah. nostalgic business now. That's important. That's very important. <laughs> about, about Steve James, um, he 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 never had really the chance to for the for the big break breakthrough because of his early death as well. But uh, the only uh, starring role uh, was was Riverbend, I think, the main as, as a main character. Correct, but I liked him know. very much. He was very 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 good. And uh, um, how to tell? I I liked him also in uh, there was a movie called uh, Hero with Chuck Norris, right, uh, right. Where, where he played a sidekick as well. Um, We were. Um, um, he died, I, I think, in '93 or so. Yeah, from cancer. So about yeah, 30 years. He was ago. on his way. He wanted. To, he wanted, and he was becoming like a, a black American hero. Actually, mm -hmm. uh, he yeah. wanted to be a black American. Actually, he was great. Yeah, and he was on his way. I, I, I don't know if the chance would have come, uh, but but uh, yeah, sadly enough, he died very young. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, Probably the last last question for yeah. for this interview could be: um, What do you think about today's action movies and um, compared to the 80s, and about the revival of the 80s stars? So this uh, expandables uh, uh, phenomenon, if yeah, you can say so. Uh, listen, the the action cinema went through transformation because of few reasons. First of all, technically, mm -hmm. today's 
not not only today, in the last 20 years, let's say, the possibility with optical effects are limitless. You can, today, mm -hmm. the filmmaker can do whatever they want to, know, to do. So the, the action is very spectacular. Even if we take the Fast and the Furious, let's say. Yes. The action is magnificent, but it borders, it's beyond fantasy. If you had a car going, you know, flying from one building to another <laughs> building, that's fantasy. A car cannot fly from one building. <laughs> it doesn't happen. So, but, but with the influence of uh, the superhero, Spider-Man, Superman, all this, this group of superheroes, mm -hmm. with the influence of uh, video games, because the kids that go and see action movie today, they grew up on video games. And in the video games, the action goes to, a, to the level of fantasy. It's beyond yes. reality. So, and, and the budgets are huge today for action movies. You're, we are talking 100 million, 200 million budget. So the people who create action today, they can do whatever comes to, to imagination. But in the other hand, because so much of it relies on effects and, and, you know, people are flipping in the air, but at some point you realize that they are hanging from a wire. They don't do it, you know. <laughs> so what the cinema lost was the immediacy, the, 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 feel, the physical feeling of mm -hmm. uh, what can be done. Uh, so... When we look at the, at the movies of the 80s or the Westerns prior to this, but, but especially the action movies of the 80s and the beginning of the 90s, 90s. Mm -hmm. the, the, the feeling is that the action is really executed. So as an audience, I said, it's, you don't have to be analytic. You don't have to sit there as an audience and say, oh, yeah, this. But there is a general feeling that the action is really happening, a feeling. When you see today in an action movie, you say, wow, this is exciting, but it's not happening. It's all, you can get the feeling, if, if you, even if you are not a, a specialist of cinema, you get this feeling that this is mm -hmm. mechanically, it's not mechanically. real. And the hero of the action movies of today, mm -hmm. uh, okay, you see a close-up of the hero, but immediately when the camera pull back, you get the feeling that this it's not him. It's the it's a stunt double or stunt. action double. So not every movie is Tom Cruise. You know the, the legacy yeah. is Tom Cruise. He's doing everything himself. But <laughs> but obviously in the big movies they don't do it. The, the action is so sophisticated and so. So you get the feeling also. You get this feeling that the hero, the actor, that's it. the actor is not the one who performed the action or the hero. So all of this together, this is the big difference between the in the eighties. You had if if you know if uh, Sylvester Stallone had to do something, he did it. And to to a certain point, of course, sometimes there are doubles, but but he did what he did. Or Arnold Schwarzenegger, he did it. Michael Dudikoff, and 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 this gives you a, a, a certain feeling as an audience that you feel the the action is really brutal. And nowadays you say, well, the hero is not, anyway, no, he's not doing it, so who cares? <laughs> and some, some uh, but, but it's spectacular. Sorry. And uh, the resurrection, so this is the feeling. So that's why there, there is a little bit going back to the 80s. Mm -hmm. and, and that's why the Stallone movies <laughs> with all of the heroes were, had a limited success. Uh, some success because this this is nostalgia. They say let's bring back this feeling of uh, I don't know, we really we're doing what we are doing. Mm -hmm. What you see in the screen is, and uh, I must say I, I saw the last James movie, uh, No Time to Die. It also it has this little bit minimum minimum of uh, uh, optical effect. Yes, mm -hmm. you know you see a motorcycle going down the stairs. You can feel that it's really going down the surface. It's no, no, no <laughs> it's special important. effects, no optical effects. Some stunt people really did it. Uh, they used few effects here and there, but most of the action in the last James Bond movie was physical action. That you, so again, it gives you this feeling that it's really happening. So this you, is the difference. It's, it doesn't mean any anything. This is beautiful and this is beautiful. You know, if you want to see Spider Man and you want to see the. the 
uh, gathering of all the Iron Man and the Spider Man and the Superwoman together, then that's that's what you go and see, and, and that's the type of action you get, and the, the pleasure that you get from this action versus the pleasure as an audience that you get from the other type of action. Yes, yes, that's all. So, but, um, but, but nobody will do today, you know, the studios because of money, because nobody will do uh, 80 types of action today because it costs economically, a lot. it doesn't. It costs a lot. Mm. It, it, yeah, and the young audience, the young people that grew up, as I mentioned, on the video games, mm -hmm. they expect to see Superman. They expect to see yeah. Spider-Man. That's, that's what they want that's to see. The point. Today. That's yeah. the point. Um, thank you very much, Sam, for this interview. It was uh, a great, great uh, honor and pleasure to, to talk to you. And uh, the last question for me is, uh, what was or what is uh, Sam Furstenberg's uh, Ars Poetica as a director. So when you directed the movie, what was the your uh, opinion to do to your Ars Poetica I on the set? I will tell you. <laughs> My purpose was in the cinema to tell stories, mm -hmm. to tell a story, entertainment. I see it. You know, there are different type of cinema. I don't want to discard the you know whatever, Bergman or Fellini or any other art movie or whatever. But the cinema, historically, the cinema was a form of entertainment, mass entertainment for the B, for the audiences. If you go all the way back to Charlie Chaplin or whatever you will. So this was always my, 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 my feeling and my purpose. I felt that my job is to take any story, which is script, word, translated to a visual storytelling, which will entertain audience, captivate audience, take them into a world of fantasy for one and a half hour. For 90 minutes, we'll take the audience from this reality into another fantasy reality with heroes, good guys, bad guy, excitement, grip, you know, uh, compelling story. And, and, uh, and the value of entertainment, this was always my purpose. Whatever, uh, any other thing that happened, any other interpretation is not for me. To <laughs> <laughs> so those are already the interpreters, the people who, who see the movie. But that's the way I see it, as, as somebody who serves the audience to, to, to bring in nice, good entertainment for 90 minutes. It so happened that, you know, some movies were action for this certain audience, but a musical was for a different uh, mm -hmm. audience, for the girls. They loved uh, breaking to electric boogaloo. And then uh, and, uh, you bring the drama, you tell story. So I see, the, I see the, the, the main purpose of a director is to be a good storyteller story, story in a visual medium. Thank you very much. Thank you.